Payout, Coach of the Fight here, getting ready for the spring feast season with Passover up first. We're going to be looking at the triumphal entry in this particular video. Looking here in the Third Testament of the Bible at chapter 11, you can see all of the different parts. This the chapter is called the work of Jesus on earth and you can see that it has a bunch of different parts here um, where it goes in and shines some light on a lot of what the Messiah went through a lot of the things that he's taught but for this one we're going to jump down here to part 16 of chapter 11 which is the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem all right, so that puts us down here in verse 90. It says, Triumphally, the multitudes received me upon my entry into the city of Jerusalem. From the towns and villages, the people came in crowds, men, women, and children, to see the master's entry into the city. They were those who had experienced the prodigy and proof of the power of the Son of God, the blind who now saw, the mute who could now sing the Hosanna, and the bedridden who had left their beds to come hurrying to see the master in the Passover feast. So he's telling us about who these people are. Remember, it wasn't everybody because a lot of people didn't believe that he was the first coming of the Christ. They didn't believe he was Christ because he came so humbly. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and a lot of other people thought that he was supposed to come amidst a lot of grandeur. They thought he was supposed to come like a conquering king all dressed in purple and casting down judgment on the people who blasphemed his name. And when he came barefoot and homeless, the majority of the people rejected him. But on this particular day, this would be the 10th day of the first month. If you know uh, the story of um, the, uh, if you know the Exodus story, you know that it was on the 10th day of the month that they were supposed to go out and choose their lamb. Well, this is actually what they're doing on the 10th day of the month. They're choosing the Messiah as the king. And of course, they're going to put him on the cross about four or five days later. Now, just as an aside note for you guys trying to get a understanding of how our sacred calendar works, I want to offer you guys this visual aid. Now, this one you're looking at is a celestial calendar that my son and I created back in 2015 when we had just started trying to understand the sacred calendar. But praise our Father in heaven, seven years later, based on the same principles that we learned in Enoch, we're able to create an analog clock that does the same thing. Whereas before we had to push the peg around the board, well, this one uses a battery to mimic the celestials. In other words, you have the opportunity to understand your years, your months, and your days using the elements of time and simple mathematics. So let me show you how this works. So you see now our clock is telling us that it is April the 7th which is in the fourth gate, if you understand the Enoch calendar. And then you have the moon hand, which is telling us that we're on the fourth day. Well, when we come around to the 10th day of the first month, the wall calendar will look more like this here. We'll be on this day. And it even gives us the hint that we'll be somewhere around April the 12th or April the 13th. So, look in the description for your opportunity to purchase one of these celestial clock calendars. But now here is talking about those who actually recognized him and those who was welcoming him, those who actually brought him in singing the hosannas there as he came in on the back of a donkey. And notice exactly who it is that he's talking about. He says, these were the ones who had experienced the prodigy and proof of the power of the Son of God, meaning they had witnessed his miracles and so they were convinced that he was the Messiah. He said, the blind who now saw, the mute who could now sing the Hosanna, and the bedridden who had left their beds 
to come Harry and to see the master and I would argue that that's who would be the ones who are going to recognize the Messiah in the second coming will be these individuals too those individuals who aren't so haughty they aren't so perfect they don't have it going on as you would say but the people who are sick the people that need him the most it will be the bedridden of the day the blind of the day the mute of the day who will want to experience the father's healing power are going to be those who actually recognize him for the second coming all right verse 91 says i knew that the triumph was momentary I had already warned my disciples of what must later happen. It was only the beginning of my struggle, and now, at much distance from those events, I tell you that the light of my truth continues in the struggle against the darkness of ignorance, sin, and falsehood, for which reason I must add that my absolute triumph has not yet arrived. Okay, you notice right here where he says... It was the only the beginning of his struggle, talking about about 2,000 years ago. And then he goes on to say, and now at my distance from those events, that's talking about today. He says, I tell you that the light of my truth continues in the struggle against darkness and ignorance, sin and falsehood. And we see a lot of this going on today. And so the Messiah is telling us here that he's still fighting against those things. Uh, darkness of ignorance, sin and falsehood. We have a lot of that going on. For which reason I must add that my absolute triumph has not yet arrived. And so the beginning of this section, it said the triumphal entry. Well, what he's telling us is that his absolute triumph hasn't taken place yet. And it will not take place until that time when we are all changed in a moment. And we see the truth come across the sky as a bolt of lightning. When we recognize him for all of his splendor and all of his power and that day is yet to come that will probably if you read revelations the the way i do you understand that that day is not going to happen until after the great earthquake talking about that global earthquake that we are awaiting verse 92 says how could you believe that the entry in jerusalem meant the triumph of my cause when few were those who have been converted and many those who did not know who i was Okay, so unlike the second coming of the Messiah, unlike that, that day, what do you call it, the hour of the, of the Lord or the, or the day of the Lord, the Bible describes it as uh, the sky cracking and uh, these fiery horses come across the sky. Um, of course, that's meant symbolically. But it is a real event in the hearts and minds of all of humanity. And that's what he's saying here. Back then, it was only a few people who recognized who he was. And how can you say that that was a triumph when there was, when there was so, so few of them? When we, on the day that he's going to claim triumph, we're all going to know it. What did he say? Every eye shall see him. There's not going to be any Pharisees or Sadducees or any doubters whatsoever. Every, he says, his, his name is going to be on everybody's lips. And even if that humanity had been converted to my word, were they not yet many generations to come? Whereas back then, as it says right here, there was a lot of people who didn't know who he was. Like I said a few minutes ago, they didn't recognize him because he was humble. They didn't expect the king to come back in a humble condition, and so they rejected him. But then in verse 93, it says, And even if that humanity had been converted by my word, were there not yet many generations to come? Talking about 2,000 years. If you read over in some of the apocryphal books like... Um, Enoch, I think, talks about it. I know it's definitely talked about in the, the book of Adam and Eve, which is found in the Forgotten Books of Eden. It talks about how the Messiah is supposed to come the first time at day five, and then how he's supposed to come the second day at day seven, which implies that it's actually 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming. And that's why a lot of people are getting excited these days and talking about the second coming, because we're almost at the two thousand day mark 
Let's go down to verse 94. He says, That moment of jubilation, that fleeting triumphal entry, was only a reflection of that triumph of light, good, truth, love, and justice that will come one day, to which you are all invited. Talking about again that day when we are all expecting to see him. Now, there are those now who know that the Messiah is back already, just like it was back in the day before this triumphal entry. There was many people who knew that he was the Messiah. Remember, John the Baptist knew who he was. The disciples, they knew who he was. But at this triumphal entry, there was a lot more people who had found out who he was on that day. And so what he's talking about here is how that triumphal entry was just a reflection of that moment, that moment when everybody's going to find out. And to that he says, we're all invited. Yeah, we hear that every eye is going to see him. Everybody's going to know he's back at one time. You look there at 95, he says, Know that if even one of my children is still found outside New Jerusalem, there will be no celebration. For God would not be able to speak of triumph. He cannot celebrate if his power has not been able to save even the last of his children. Now, there's going to be many who are going to be confused by this because he's like, wait a minute. Everybody is not going to be celebrating, but what he's talking about is after everything is said and done, after the tribulation is over with, after you know everything has calmed back down, at that point, everybody is going to be on his side, even those who are have now been cast into the spirit world, and that's going to be a lot of people. They too, in the spirit world, will come to recognize the Messiah as our true father. But those that will be left here on earth, they're going to recognize it too. So everybody's going to get it then. There are people that are alive and those that are dead are all going to get it and know it at that point. And that's what he's talking about here. This new Jerusalem, there will only be a celebration when everybody is accounted for. At one point, we will have an accountability for every soul that has ever been created on the planet. 96. You are they who in the second time sang the Hosanna when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Now that I manifest to you in the spirit, you do not throw your cloaks before me. It is your hearts that you offer for the dwelling place of the Lord. Today, your Hosanna is not shouted from your throats. This Hosanna springs from your spirit as a hymn of humility, love and recognition of the Father as a hymn of faith in the manifestation that in the third era your Lord has come to offer you. All right, let's slow down for a minute. This verse right here should have caught a lot of people off guard because if you look at what he's saying here, he's talking about the reincarnation of the spirits and he's telling those that are actually hearing this word, those that are seeing this third testament and grabbing on to the fact that we have a whole new testament of the Bible that is adding to what we got in the first era which was the law and adding to what we got in the second era which is love and adding spirit in this third era what he's saying here is that we are the resurrected spirits of those same individuals that was there doing the triumphal entry Think about that for a second. We know the story of how he came in on the back of a donkey and there were people throwing their cloaks on the ground and throwing you know, other clothes garments on the ground so this donkey could walk across it and everybody was singing Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, what he's saying here is we are those people. Those people, we are them. Right there he says, you are they who in the second time sang the Hosanna when Jesus entered Jerusalem. He says, now that I manifest myself to you in the spirit, see, then he was in the flesh, now he's in the spirit. And this is what we talked about a few minutes ago, about how he is back. He is back now in the spirit. And this is why a lot of people don't recognize him as having returned. If you go down there to the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug and start telling him about how the Messiah has returned, he's going to laugh you out of the church. And the reason why is because he's expecting a material manifestation. 
Some of them are expecting him to come back in the form of a person, actually. And some of them are expecting to come back with these chariots of fire going across the sky. Most of them are actually expecting something they're going to be able to see with their eyes. They're looking on YouTube to find it, looking for videos. Somebody come and say the Messiah is back. The first thing they do is click through to try to find a picture of what he actually looks like because they want to see something with their eyes. This is why they're missing him in this time is because he's coming in the spirit and the spirit he is a spiritual being and now we're learning how to recognize him as a spiritual being and you cannot see spirits you can't see spirits you have to feel them you have to hear them from within and that's where we'll find the messiah at if and when we start to look for him is we'll see him from within but that's what the scripture meant when he said that nobody knows the day or the hour that the son of man will come unto you nobody knows that he said he will come as a thief in the night what he meant by nobody knows the day or the hour is because you don't know when you're going to recognize him as a spiritual being that's already back some people already knew this long time ago they already realized that the messiah has returned many many years ago some people just found out not too long ago there are some people who watching this video are going to realize that the messiah is back now and then there will be people tomorrow and then there will be some, the majority of humanity is not going to find out, like we said, until after the great earthquake. So that's what he meant by there's no way for you to know the day or the hour is because it's on an individual basis. You don't know when you are going to find out. So there's no way for there's there's no set time for it to come. It could be any time. Like I said, it could even be in doing this video. But let's go on. He says, this time you won't be throwing your clothes in front of me. He said, it's your heart that we will be offering him. The only thing is, some of us don't recognize that. He says, today your Hosanna is not shouted with your throats. This Hosanna springs from your spirits as a hymn of humility. So this is how we're singing to him now. Whereas before we were shouting as loud as we could. This time the way we shout, our voice comes in humility. Our voice comes with love. Our voice comes with the recognition of the Father. That's when you don't see a bunch of people out there screaming Hosanna or shouting up and down. But you do see a lot of people who are becoming spiritualized take on this humility to take on love and to recognize the Father. He says, as a hymn of faith in this manifestation, that is the third error. Your Lord has come to offer you. Talking about the third era here, this is why we have a third testament of the Bible. Each time we enter a new period, we have to have the rules of the road to go by. That's why Moses got those rules. It's because humanity had changed. That's why we got the, the New Testament there with, with uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is because once again, humanity had changed. And now, the spiritual valley is coming down upon mankind. And we need some additional rules to go by because we don't learn about much about the spirit in the New Testament or the Old Testament. We're going to have to learn about the spirit in the Third Testament because we're recognizing how much power the spirit world has over humanity. The main reason they have so much power over us is because we don't recognize them. We were not spiritual individuals yet. And so they're pretty much having their way with us. But once we use this information that we're getting in the Third Testament, we will actually learn to uh, combat against the evil spirits that control us and learn how to take advantage, for lack of a better word, of the good spirits that are helping us out. But let's go on. He says, then, like now, you follow me and my interest to Jerusalem. The great multitude surround me, captivated by my words of love. Men and women, the elderly and children. The city trembled with their voices of jubilee. The very priests and Pharisees, fearing that the people might rebel, said to me, Master, if you teach peace, why do you permit your disciples to raise a scandal in this manner? And I answered, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would cry out. 
For these were the moments of jubilee, the culmination and the glorification of the Messiah among those hungry and thirsty for justice and those spirits that for a long time had awaited the coming of the Lord in fulfillment of his prophecies. That's a pretty long verse there. Let's go up here and take it a little bit slower. See right here where he said that we follow him into Jerusalem. These are the people who are following him in the spirit. A lot of people are embracing this third testament of the Bible and they're studying this thing and they're getting a wealth of information out of it. That's what he's talking about. You remember in John chapter 1 verse 1, he pretty much said the word of God is God. And so for those people who are following his word, they are following him into Jerusalem. And then he talks about the great multitudes that surrounded him as he entered in through that time. But look right here how he says that priests and the Pharisees, fearing that the people might rebel, said, Master, if you, if you teach peace, why do you permit these disciples to raise a scandal in this manner? That's the same thing that the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug is doing. He don't even want people to hear about the Third Testament of the Bible because he's fearing that the people are going to rebel. And they are. When they learn that, you know, grandeur is not how we're supposed to be. When they learn that, you know, uh, we're not supposed to be teaching against the law. We're supposed to be teaching for the law. People are actually supposed to be obeying the law. And we find out that, the, you know, the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug has been telling us this whole time that we aren't supposed to be obeying the law. People are going to rebel. But what did the Messiah tell him? He said, if these people don't cry out, then the, even the stones will cry out. And so he's kind of jumping back and forth here. Right here he's talking about these were the moments of Jubilee. And for those that are recognizing the Messiah and for who he is in today's time, they are in Jubilee too. I know, I know I was extremely excited when I started to hear this third testament and how it rang true in my heart. And I knew that it was it was him speaking to me and giving me so much information. It was like the most wonderful time of my life hearing this. And I know I'm I'm not the only person that it, that this has happened to. There's a lot of people going through this jubilee moment. Why? Because we are hungry and thirsty for justice. We're hungry and thirsty for truth. He says, of those spirits that for a long time have awaited the coming of the Lord and fulfillment of his prophecies. Yeah. And so once we start to recognize that he's already here, he's already, we're already seeing these prophecies take place. Yeah, it is an extremely exciting time for us. Now, for those people that are materialistic, we'll find out later on that, you know, they want nothing to do with it. They, they want to protect their material items and they know that spiritualism is the biggest threat to their materialistic world and so they want nothing to do with it they're, they're going to try to hide it from us as and and fight against it as long as they possibly can but you know as long as they possibly can yeah that's pretty much going to be the earthquake when you know their father promised us that every building is going to be shaken down to the ground it is at that point that they're going to lose all of their material possessions and that's why a lot of the world or most of the world or even everybody in the world will become spiritual beings at that point sadly though a lot of people will go into the spirit world and they won't be able to take advantage of you know this enlightenment that the rest of us or the I can't say I can't say well I'm gonna survive it or not but that the rest of the world will go through you know because they'll be in the spirit world but you know they're, they're gonna be alright they're, they're gonna be alright too everybody is going to be able to take advantage of the, the benefits that the and the promises that that we've received from the Father, um, even the ones in the spirit world, they're, they're going to be all right too. But let's look at 98. He says, In that jubilee and gladness, my people also celebrated their liberation from Egypt. That commemoration of the Passover, I wish to make unforgettable by my people. Yet truly I tell you that I did not comply with the simple tradition of the sacrifice of a lamb. No, I offered myself in Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, as the road through whom all my children must be redeemed. 
All right, talking about the liberation from Egypt and tying that to Passover. I think that's extremely important here in this Passover season. And that's what we're going to talk about in our next class is the Last Supper. So consider um, hitting the subscribe button and the bell button so you can actually see those classes when we're coming out. But in this class, we're finishing up talking about the triumphal entry. And it's talking about how in, the, in that jubilee and gladness, how the people were celebrating their liberation from Egypt. And just as a little no another side note, you don't hear about Egypt too much in the scripture. Although you hear about it enough and people kind of wonder, what does it mean by Egypt? Why is today's society uh, called Egypt so many times? Well, to put it pretty quickly, Egypt was the first times that the father's people actually had to pay to eat. Humans are still the only beings on the planet that have to pay to eat. But if you remember the story of how Jacob and his 12 sons ended up in Egypt, it was because there was a world famine and they had no food. And so they ended up having to go into Egypt to get food. And for the first time, they had to exchange gold and silver to eat. And even to this day, we still have to exchange money for food and like I said we are the only beings on the planet that actually has to pay to eat and another thing that happened in Egypt if you know the story of Pharaoh and why they call him the king of the dead or something like that that was the first time that humanity had to actually pay to be buried as well that's how Pharaoh became Pharaoh is because he charged people a lot of money to bury them and so now when you think about it we are still the only ones that have to pay to eat and we are still the only ones that have to pay to die that is what Egypt is all about and so that's what we're going to be liberated from in the hour of the Lord when we have this global earthquake that comes and shakes down all of these governmental systems it destroys the beast we're not, we're not going to have to worry about that anymore those that are still around will learn to recognize the father providing them with their food and uh, that nobody's going to be taking advantage of us when we die as well. But I think it's really, really interesting that he's tying this over to Passover. We just did a class. It's talking about the importance of Passover. It helps bring to light how unforgettable Passover really is, how we shouldn't forget Passover. I made an argument in that class on how that was what caused them to be out there in the wilderness for 40 years was because they wasn't doing Passover. But you can check that out over there in that other class. And then he goes on to talk about how he didn't keep up with the traditions of Passover. And even if you don't look at the future classes that we're going to put out on Passover, you can take this as a note is that, you know, the father changed the sacrificial lamb deal. He kind of changed that to instead of sacrificing a lamb, he changed the Passover ceremony to where we now have what they call communion with the bread and the wine there. That's why they do that. And so we should be tying that to Passover. We should be doing that uh, communion feast during the Passover season. It goes on to say that his sacrifice was the road through whom all my children must be redeemed. Talk about his blood on the cross for us. And we'll, we'll save that one for another class as well. All right, y'all. I wanted to go ahead and get this one done before I jump down into the Last Supper. We're going to talk more about Passover in that one. So like I said, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you can see when that class comes out if you haven't done so already leave a comment below hit the like button if you got something out of it and pray for us shalom